What is that superpower in building this B2B lead gen company? People management. Well, specifically how to communicate effectively when you're trying to get a point across. If my team member does something that I didn't tell them to do or they didn't do it correctly, I really had to learn how do, first of all, how do I get them to improve? But then at the same time, I don't want to put them down or make them feel like the world just ended. I want them to also, hey, you did this well, good job on that. Next time, let's do this and this. And also just being there and supportive. And this that translates into business, but then also translates into relationships, friendships. When you are, let's say your friend did something or your girlfriend did something, it's not just, you don't want to explode out on them. It's the structure of what they did well, what they could have done better, and then circling back on what they did well and just really make them feel appreciated and make them feel like, hey, we did that was good, but less time, let's do X, Y, and Z. That's something I've really, really started to learn. Are an inspiring group of people. Every one of them, from the larger than life comic book heroes you see on the big silver screen, the everyday heroes that let us live the privileged lives we do. Every hero has a story to tell from the doctor saving lives at your local hospital, to the war veteran down the street who risked his life for our freedom, to the police officers and the firefighters who risk their safety to ensure ours. Every hero is special and every story worth telling. But there is one class of heroes that I think is often ignored the entrepreneur, the creator, the producer, the ones who look at the problems in this world and think to themselves, you know what? I can fix that. I can help people. I can make a difference. Then they go out and do exactly that by creating a new product or introducing a new service. Some go on to change the world. Others make a world of difference to their customers. Welcome to The Hero Show. Join us as we pull back the masks on the world's finest heropreneurs and learn the secrets to their powers, their success, and their influence. So you can use those secrets to attract more sales, make more money, and experience more freedom in your business. I'm your host, Richard Matthews, and we are on in three, two, one. Hello and welcome back to The Hero Show. My name is Richard Matthews and today I have the pleasure of having Abdel on the line. Abdel, are you there? I'm here. Hello, oh, everyone. So glad to have you here. And this is, it's been a while since we've had an international guest, but you are coming in from Great Britain. Is that right? Yes, it is good old England. Yeah. Where in England is home for you? It's an hour and a half away from London. It's a small a town called Brighton. If it helps, PewDiePie lives there. Whoever knows yeah, who that is. <laughs> a big YouTuber. That's fun. I'm really looking forward to getting over to Great Britain. So far, the closest I've been to it is I flew over it on my way to Germany once. And I was like, oh, look, there's London. You can see it. So, you know, that's the closest I've been. <laughs> you know you're in England when you have absolutely terrible weather, freezing cold feet, and tremendous amount of rain. That's England for you. That sounds good. And so what I want to do before we get too far in this interview is I want to go over a brief introduction of who you are, and then we'll get in dive right into your story. So Abdel is the owner of a B2B lead generation company, Zaniver, that specializes in acquiring sales opportunities through cold email on a pay per qualified sales opportunity basis. Been doing this since 2023 and so far I've generated hundreds of calls for clients and hundreds of thousands in pipeline revenue. Born and raised in Egypt and moved to the UK in 2015 with your family, flew in Arabic and first discovered entrepreneurship when you were 18 years old, trying to find another pathway than the traditional jobs, you know, doctor, lawyer, dentist, that kind of stuff that your culture praises and ever since have found much more fulfillment and enjoyment as an entrepreneur, which I think is really cool. And one of the reasons why we invited you onto the show, we mm -hmm. actually work with you with Push Button Podcasts, which is our company and you help deliver leads and stuff for us. And what's amazing to me is you're running this company, you're running Xanover while attending university. Is that correct? Yep, that's absolutely correct. I'm a pharmacy student at university. So and just out of curiosity, which one's more fun, pharmacy student work or your entrepreneurship work? What do you think? <laughs> well, someone who has done that as well. I ran a photography business when I was in college. That's how I paid my way through college was with my camera. I enjoyed the photography work way more than the school work. Mm. <laughs> no, it's the entrepreneurship aspects of things is I get a lot more fulfillment out of. Specifically, when I see my clients winning, I'm having an impact on their business. I'm like, hey, Abdel, we just closed so-and-so that you brought them. I'm like, yes. You don't get the same feeling when a lecturer is talking about biology or how cells work. You just sit there and think, <laughs> it's not the same. It's not comparable. You caught the bug, the entrepreneurship <laughs> bug, right? And I was like, you know, the world should absolutely praise the people who are doing your pharmacy work mm -hmm. and the other things, all the things that you have to have college degrees for. We need all of that stuff. But for those crazy people like you and I, um, for whom, you know, that stuff is boring yeah. and the risk and everything that's associated and the fun that's associated yeah. with running a business. It's a different world for sure. 
No, yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's just the aspect of making of like you're creating your own pathway with the other routes. You already have, you already know the pathway, what you're gonna do next, the steps, because so many of your forefathers have done it before. You know how it goes with this kind of entrepreneurship, building a company. You, you're obviously planning and you do this strategically and logically, but then it's always in the back of your mind of what can we do next? It is was just one foot in front of the other. Yeah, absolutely. So you're in college. You've got your B2B lead gen company that you've started. How big is your staff right now? Is it just you or do you have more people on your agency? No. So I have about four people on the team. It's me. I'm in charge of kind of our own client acquisition, of course, sales and making sure that my clients and your campaigns are performing exceptionally and they're hitting the KPI. My team members, they manage the day to day activities of making sure that the sales opportunities are being booked on the calendar, qualifying them, et cetera, et cetera, making sure that the campaigns are technically sound because with cold email, you really have to make sure, especially now, you really have to make sure that the tech infrastructure in place lands you in the inbox at least 95% of the time. So I get my team members to make sure that's the case with every campaign we run. And in the scenario where the tech infrastructure is not good, then we, we build it again and we restart and make sure the campaigns running are hitting KPIs. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess just out of curiosity, are you hiring fellow university students to be on your team or are you hiring more yeah. family, like outside of school? That's a good question. To be honest, when I'm looking for a role or I'm looking at what I'm hiring, it's not, it's obvious, it's if they're young like me and they're looking for opportunity and I can smell to put it in the hustler in them, then absolutely I would hire them. But it's more of the aspect, okay, can they do the job? And if I can sense that there's like this, because we're still a small company, so obviously we're looking to expand and I'm not taking on anyone who's just here for a quick buck. I want people who are really looking to grow this thing with me, looking to stay on a long time and not just limit themselves in the box of the day-to-day -day role, where in six months, they could be my copywriter, for example, or they could mm. be um, taken on sales call as well. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, I hope I answered your question there. <laughs> you're definitely, you're looking for other hustlers like yourself to help grow the company, which is cool. And it yeah. is great to be doing that while you're in school, you know, because you still have school is, and whatever you're training for is always a good backup as you're learning and growing your first company. So what I want to get into is your origin story. Right. Uh, every comic book hero has an origin story. It's the thing that made them into the hero they are today. We want to hear that story. Were you born a hero or were you bit by a radioactive spider that made you want to start a company while you're in, in college? Or did you start a job and eventually shift over to becoming an entrepreneur? Basically, how did you get here? I know we're early in your journey, but how did you get here from where you started? That's a good question. Let's dive back into 2021. I didn't discover entrepreneurship then. Okay. Oh, I had my first whiff of it but I will never really explored it further. Back then I was, I had the goal of absolute career of no, I'm going to be a healthcare professional. And so I'm going to do this, is what my family has always done, but something in me just picked up that I saw the rich dad classic, the classic rich dad, poor dad. I picked it up, I opened it and then it was an entire 180 perspective shift on essentially what I want to do, especially when it's talking and it's talking about that. And I, I don't mean this as in like, as a diss to anyone who's working nine to five, because absolutely we need them. I mean, it's just the nine, like being a pharmacist or being a doctor or being a lawyer, all these things, it's kind of typically where, what my culture strives for. I didn't want to be like my forefathers. I wanted to be something different. Because my father's a doctor, my grandfather is was a physics teacher. So, and then we don't really have, a, I guess you can say, an entrepreneur, a businessman in the family. And I'm looking, and God's willing, I'm looking to achieve things that my forefathers never have achieved. I won't be able to do that if I'm just a pharmacist. I want more in life. I'm greedy. I'm hungry. Yeah, I, it's very similar for me. My dad actually brought home a copy of the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book when I was like nine or 10 years old. 
And one of his buddies at work thought I would like it because he met me at one of those father, you know, bring your kid to work days. And one of his buddies was like, you should give this book to your son. So I got a copy of that book from one of my dad's friends. And I read that book probably like six times back to front to back, like in the first couple of weeks. I was like, this is different. This is different than anything I've ever seen because it's, you know, it's talking about, you know, for those of you who are familiar with the rich dad, poor dad stuff, he talks about the cash flow quadrant, right? You know, E quadrant is an entrepreneur, S quadrant is self-employed, B quadrant is business owner, I quadrant is investor. And it was the first time I'd ever heard that concept. And I remember as a kid thinking, okay, my dad and my mom are in this E quadrant. There's nothing wrong with that. They said, there's plenty of people who have really successful careers and lives in the E quadrant, Um, but I'd never heard of these other three. And like, I learned about those things and I was like, "Mm, I like this B quadrant one. I want to be there. And, you know, because he talks a lot about, you know, building systems and then a system that runs itself. And then, you know, just the scale of value, right? Because Mm -hmm. as an employee, your scale of value has a lot to do with like how many people you can serve. Right. And for most businesses you're serving or as an employee or a small business, you know, like a doctor or a lawyer, you're serving just a small subset of people. But with a business, you can scale that value out right to your team where you're serving thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or, you know, in the terms of like really big businesses like, say, Apple or Microsoft, billions of people. Right. Mm -hmm. You can just you can scale that value significantly more in those spaces. And yeah, that was, it's really what attracted me to it. I was like, oh, there is an ability to take what you are good at or your skills and just expand. Yeah, and just expand it. Yeah, and just try. And it's, it, it, I read that and then obviously I was reading Millionaire Fast Lane and then got into the sales books by Jordan Belfort and started reading and then Alex Ramosi and then all these things. And I thought, well, I'm young. I can, what's the worst thing that can happen? There's only upside here. There's no downside. <laughs> if you truly think about it, there's, there's no, I have no mortgage to pay. I have no um, family I need to feed. It's, there's only so much potential here. And in the case that, God forbid, it doesn't work out, I'll be back to where I was, which is, it's not exactly a bad place, is it? Yeah. So it's only <laughs> upside. So why not just try right. right. It's definitely different, you know, like for my life. And, you know, I got four kids and a wife and a whole lifestyle to like keep going. So I have to, you know. It's a different game if you're trying to start it later in life. But, you know, starting in college, that kind of stuff, you're absolutely right. You have just upside potential. So why not? Why not take the risk? Why not see what you're capable of? Why not push the boundaries a little bit and see if you can get a different set of results? Yeah, no, I mean, what's the downside? I miss out on the college parties. I don't go out with my friends when they go to the pub or anything like that. I'm not into these things anyway. So it was truly only upside for me. So I thought, screw it, man. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. I was the same way. That's why oh, yeah. I started my business in college. I actually, I don't take this as advice if you're in college or yourself, but I did drop out of college and <laughs> two and a half years in, I only had like, man, I had like six weeks left to get my bachelor's degree. And I was just like, really? yeah, I'm like, I just don't care because you my the finish line, I just didn't, I didn't cross the finish line and I could have had a bachelor's, but instead I just have an A, a what do they call it? A associate's degree. So I have an associate's degree from college. And even though I have almost all of the credits to get a bachelor's degree, I probably should at some point finish it, but I didn't want to. I was like, I have this business that I'm running and I want to do that. So I did. So anyways, all I'm just saying is I understand. <laughs> Been there, <done> that, <laughs> have that t-shirt. It's worth. It's a worthwhile game to play, uh, I think anyways. So Yeah, yeah, no, yeah for sure. All so, upside. But my next question for you then is your superpowers, right? Every iconic hero has a superpower, whether that's a fancy flying suit or you know, made by their genius intellect or super strength or their ability to call down thunder from the sky. In the real world, heroes have what I call a zone of genius, which is either a skill or a set of skills that they were born with or they developed over the course of their career that energize all their other skills. And the superpower is what sets you apart and allows you to help people, help your people slay their villains and come out on top of their own journeys. And so when you think of your superpower, think about the skills that you've been developing over the course of starting your business here. And it's the common thread that's tying those skills together. What is that common thread for you? What is that superpower in building this B2B lead gen company? People management, or specifically how to communicate effectively when you're trying to get a point across. If my team member does something that I didn't tell them to do or they didn't do it correctly, I really had to learn how do, first of all, how do I get them to improve? But then at the same time, I don't want to put them down or make them feel like the world just ended. I want them to also, hey, you did this well, good job on that. Next time, let's do this and this. And also just being there and supportive. And this that translates into business, but then also translate into relationships, friendships. 
when you are, let's say your friend did something or your girlfriend did something, it's not just, you don't want to explode out on them. It's the structure of what they did well, what they could have done better, and then circling back on what they did well and just really make them feel appreciated and make them feel like, hey, we did that was good, but less time, let's do X, Y, and Z. That's something that I've really started to learn and I got it from How to Unfriend and Influence People, classic book. Yeah, that is a fantastic book. I call that the compliment sandwich. I don't know if that's what he calls in that book, but I actually did some training with our staff on that as well. And I know it's something that's really valuable. And it's something I do with my kids, something I do with my wife, it's something I do with all my staff members. And the idea is basically like, if you're constantly working towards progress, then things are going to change. That By necessity, they have to be better than they were this time, right? Next time we have to do it better, which means things have to change. Right. And as you're going through and building things, you're going to break things. You're going to make mistakes. Right. You know, mistakes I call you know, those stepping stones to success. And so if you're going to communicate with other people about improvements, right, which is, you know, that's positive criticism and about fixing mistakes, which, again, is positive criticism. You have to know how to manage people in a way that yeah. not only are they open to that criticism, but they accept it well. And then they make those changes with enthusiasm and not with like, oh, I suck, right? And so I didn't realize this. And one of these things that you'll probably realize as you start building your team is it's not just important that you communicate that way. It's also important that you teach your staff how and why you communicate that way. So they communicate to each other that way as well. And that was one of the lessons that I learned just this last year as we started growing our company (laughs) more and more people. So it's, you know, future lesson for you as your organization gets bigger that people management skill is not something that humans are built with. Like you, it doesn't come now. No, no. And so you have to learn that skill yourself and then learn how to teach that skill to your staff as you grow. So that's a great lesson. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put back, I will go back in the comment section when I finally learned it and I'll say, Richard was right. He was right about this point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's talk about the flip side then. So if your superpower has been learning those people management skills, the flip side is, of course, of every superpower is the fatal flaw, right? Just like Superman has his kryptonite or Wonder Woman can't remove her bracelets of victory without going mad. You probably have a flaw that's held you back in your business so far, right? Some of the things that I struggled with for a long time, things like perfectionism. I want to get this exactly right. And so I would never ship something. And if you don't ship anything, you're not doing anything in the marketplace, you don't actually have a business. Or one of the other ones that I struggled with, and maybe you relate to this, is I had a lack of self-care. That meant I let my clients walk all over me. I didn't have good boundaries early on. I let my time get away from me. I'd spend 8, 10, 12 hours a day, 60 days a week working and not realizing that wasn't actually helping my business. It was hurting it. So I think more important than what the flaw is, how have you been working to overcome that as you start off your entrepreneurial career? One million percent has to be panicking too much. I mean, I mean, panicking too much. For example, let's say we launch a brand new campaign and it doesn't book meetings or doesn't get any interested leads in the first day. That doesn't mean that the campaign is bad just because on its first day it didn't perform, okay? Yeah. Because the next four days, it could book us seven meetings and turns out that this campaign was actually a winner, but all I had to do was just wait. You had to have Yeah, yeah. It's the patience and then it's, always, it's the aspect of panicking too much too early and then not waiting for actually letting the correct tests run through. I'm a guy who just always... Quick, next one, next one. Okay, next campaign. Okay, this doesn't work. Change it. It's a fault. I need to be more patient. And I've been trying to do that with like, okay, why am I actually worried about this? Did I let it, did I let this campaign run enough? Or did I test out the script enough times to determine it was bad? Panicking too much too early. That's essentially it. So that's a really good thing to learn early. And if you really want to get into the nitty gritty stuff of it, particularly with, you know, the types of campaigns you're running, look into Bayesian statistics. Mm. And so Bayesian statistics is like, I'm not super well studying this, but one of my good friends is, and we've talked about it a lot in our mastermind. And it's this idea, there's a whole thing, a whole bunch of things that go into that. But the small point that I want to bring up is just this idea that you have to have enough data before you can make a good decision, right? And that set of data is generally smaller than people think it is, right? People think they have to have, you know, this tremendous amount of data to decide whether it's yes or no. It's a lot less than that, generally. That's where the Bayesian part comes in. But you still have to get that data, right? And to your point, the first day of the campaign is probably not enough data to know whether or not it was <laughs> worthwhile. And so you have to know, you have to start building into your processes. Okay, like, when do I know we've got to get enough data, right? And then you have to have, like, the patience to just leave it alone. 
And so my suggestion for you is in a completely different realm. Um, if you haven't done this already, learn to cook, right? Learn to cook. I already know how to cook. Yeah. So it's things like, you know, when you learn to cook steak, like learning to sear a steak or learning to do some of those things where you just have to let it caramelize, right? You have to let it. And it's that. You're done right. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't, because brown food tastes good, right? And raw food doesn't taste good. So you're like, let it cook, let it sit yeah. there. And like, I still tease my wife all the time about this because she's a futzer, right? In the kitchen. And she, I'm like, you just put it there and just walk away. Like it is when it says it needs to sit for six minutes, let it sit for the six minutes. And so it's that same bit of patience. You're like, I know this campaign needs to sit for three days and it needs to run through its stuff. Or maybe it's five days or seven days or whatever it is. Whenever you know what that KPI is, don't futz with it. Just let it do its thing. You want to hear the funny thing? I'm the exact same with cooking. I'm always like, I just stirred the thing 30 minutes, 30 seconds ago and I'll be stirring it again. And I'm thinking it's not fast enough. I need to cook quick, fast with the exact same mistake. Instructions say six minutes. I'm like, after two minutes, yeah, that's enough. Just flip it. <laughs> and it hasn't finished caramelizing yet. And that's where, that's where I see, like, learning to cook is a really useful way to learn that skill because it's a lot shorter time frames, right? You know, when the steak, when you're cooking a steak, when you're pan searing a steak, it's like three minutes on one side, three minutes on the other side, but you have to let it sit there for three minutes. If you futz with it the whole time, it won't ever caramelize, right? So you just got to, and, so, and you can you get it, that immediate feedback of when it's not caramelized, it's not nearly as good. Right. It doesn't no. taste as good and let it get the caramelization on there. And so you, you get that, what do you call it? The, the feedback loop, the positive yes. feedback loop is really yeah. short compared to like what you're doing in the business where the feedback loop is sometimes a day or weeks even for a campaign. Mm. It's that same sort of mental process of like, I just have to let it get through this portion to get the positive reward. And so that's why I was like, you know, cooking is a great way to build that little, if you have that flaw of wanting to futz with things and you know, you have to have the time to do them, learn to cook. Oh, man, you're absolutely right. It's, I know how to cook, but I don't know how to wait. So the problem is not cooking. The problem is waiting. <laughs> so le learn specifically, like pick up some things that you know that just have to sit there. Like, like get a good tomato bisque recipe, right? That's one where you put all the stuff in there and you just have to let it sit for 45 minutes, like, and let it mm. simmer. Like anything that you just have to let simmer and not touch for a while, like any of those things, just play with those and get really good at them. And then you're like, okay, every time I do this the way that it's supposed to, it turns out really good. You'll build that positive reinforcement loop. I should definitely do that. So let's switch gears then. And I want to talk a little bit about your common enemy, right? So every superhero has an arch nemesis, right? And it's a thing that they mm. constantly have to fight against in their world. And in the world of business, we like to put it in the context of your clients, right? And so it's a mindset or a flaw that your clients come to you with that you constantly have to fight to Ooh. overcome so you can actually get them the results that they came to you for. So in the world of B2B lead generation, what is that common enemy that you regularly have to fight against? We've been burned before and we don't think outbound actually works for us. So that's one of the main common enemies. Another one is kind of the, it's the fancy word of qualified. What is qualified to them, to my clients, or when they first come on board, qualified can mean someone who is super ready to start looking to what's it is basically a really hot lead. Mm -hmm. But when they have to come on board, we have to kind of really set like an objective criteria on qualified prospect is that they jump on a meeting with where and we do that with the firmographics do they meet a certain firmographics um, they know the offering and they show up for the call to us that is the kind of the objective criteria of making sure we know what we're talking about when we say the word qualified another aspect is we've done it before and all we got was bad leads and then you have to really break that down. What is a bad lead? Is it a lead that comes aboard thinking that, I don't know. So let, let, let's do your example. Let, let's do for your specific campaign. With a bad lead, what we'll determine is they initially, we want them to come on board for being a podcast host, not a guest. Yeah. So then we would say that they're a bad lead if they come on board thinking that they're a guest. So then yeah, you kind of, you have these words being chucked around, but you don't actually know what specifically the client is referring to. They haven't been defined oh, yet. Yeah, they haven't been defined yet. So you have to set the objective criteria for it. Let's go back to the first enemy that we've been burned before. We're not sure this thing, it works for us. We work on performance basis. So yeah. because we know that this is an ex a common theme in the market. So when I first have calls with prospects, it's always getting them to believe, look, it's virtually impossible for you to get burned with us because we only work on performance basis. So, so that's how you solve you have, the enemy. That's how you yeah, 
so to speak, is with the performance marketing. So let me see if I can define this for our audience a little bit. And it's one of the things that I think is really interesting, particularly in the business space, is uh, on that, the, you know, the qualified, unqualified lead space, you're working in cold outreach, right? Cold outreach yeah. on LinkedIn, cold outreach on email, maybe cold outreach via phone call, right? That's what you guys do is cold out lead generation. Yeah, yeah. And most businesses are building and surviving and thriving. And so I always talk about four categories of lead generation. There's buy, borrow, build, blitz, right? So buying audience is like, that's your ads. You know, someone's going to see you on Facebook. And if we use Facebook, for example, they're going to see all your Facebook ads for months at a time. And then they finally click on one and then they go through a sales video, maybe a webinar, right? They're going through a process where they're getting warmed up, right? And so they're not going to come to a sales call completely cold generally from ads. And then your mm -hmm. borrow audience, borrow audience is, you know, when you get in front of, like you speak on stage or you speak on a podcast or you have a, a joint venture relationship with someone, a strategic partnership. And so all those leads are going to come over generally as someone who's heard you speak. You've been endorsed by someone that they know, like, and trust, right? They're going to come over as a referral. And so they're coming across, again, warm. And then like mm -hmm. the build category is the stuff where like you're building your own audience, right? That's where you build your YouTube channel or you build your podcast. That's what we do at Push Button Podcast. You're building your content marketing. So people are interacting with you and building all that. So when they get to the point where they're ready to buy, they already know, like, and trust you. And then you have this other one, redheaded stepchild, right, of lead generation, which is cold outreach. And mm. the cold outreach is the kind of thing that you can dial up as much as you want, but every person who's going to come across, it's going to come across cold, right? They don't know you like you trust you at this point. It's a cold mm -hmm. call, which generally means that warming up process is going to happen after the sales call. It's going to happen in the follow-up and it's going to happen in how you handle the sales call and how you handle the follow-ups with that person and your actual like sales journey with that person is going to be longer from first contact to closed sale than it would be mm -hmm. in almost any of the other categories. And so since most businesses are used to those first three categories, they get into this cold outreach category and they realize this is different. And they're like, these are bad leads. And they're like, no, they're not yeah. different. They're different leads. And so your business has to be set up to understand how you work with leads that are in this category. And so I don't know if that helps, but like just for our audience to frame the discussion that you're talking about. No, thanks for clearing up because that's absolutely correct. Like when clients, when we bring them the calls, of course, and they say to us, oh, they haven't turned into business. Why is that? I say to them, well, it's the first interaction with you. They don't know anything about your company. You ask them to spend $6,000 initially on that first call when they don't know anything about your company. Of course, it's going to take some time. You're building the relationships here. But hey, that relationship that you're asking them to spend 6000 with on, Let's say you do close them, that could turn into 48,000, just whether it's to lifetime or the referrals they bring you. So just be patient here, okay? Yeah. The sales process, especially the higher the ticket, the higher the sales process is, of course. Yeah. And especially if it's a big company that, that you're trying to close. So yeah. with cold, you have to do the, like you perfectly said, the nurturing happens after the sales call and the warming up process. So it's a multiple follow-up calls, multiple check-in calls to see where they're at, and just making sure that you have really good systems at the back end to make sure that every lead that is brought to you via cold outbound is getting the full attention it deserves to make sure that it has the highest possibility of converting. Yeah, well, I can give you know our audience, I can give them a pretty good idea because you know we've got leads coming in from all four of these categories. The first three categories are sales journey, anywhere from one to three weeks, right? Mm from first interaction, like from sales call to close. The shortest one is obviously referrals. A lot of times referrals will be like single call close kind of thing. You get out and talk to them like, yep, yeah. we're ready to go. And they'll just give you money right then, right? That's in that borrow category, right? If you're in that borrow category, that's like the shortest sales thing. In the cold outreach, it's three months, right? Yeah. It's three months. So like three weeks, three months, it's a big difference. And so when you get into this world, you have to have your business set up to be able to handle those things. Right. Be able to, how do you, what do your follow up systems look like? And I would imagine as a cold outreach company, that's one of the things that you probably have to either do education on or help people with. Maybe there's some service delivery options in there for you to, yeah, you know, do whatnot. Because I would imagine a lot of people who are getting into the cold outreach space don't even know that it's a different sales cycle when you get into cold. Yeah. It's a different sales cycle on that first call. You have to absolutely make sure that they trust you because you'll never see that person again if you two don't get on well on that first sales yeah. call from called outbound with referrals you two might flirt back and forwards about the partnership let's put it in relationship terms but you know eventually that this client will close okay yeah. if it's from a warm source but from cold if you oh, don't make a good impression on the first call you can say goodbye to that one 
and yeah. just take the loss and move on. So, and I don't know if this is helpful or not, but hopefully it's helpful for someone. One of the things that we do is, so we have our sales call, which is, it's a strategy session. And we actually give someone mm -hmm. strategy on the strategy call, right? So that's like, which I know sometimes is unheard of. People get on sales calls and they just get pitched to it. And I'm like, no, we actually help give, deliver a strategy for them and how they can use, in our case, podcasting to build their company, right? So they get a positive interaction on the sales call. And then on the back end, we have several different um, other follow-up calls that we already have just built into our follow-up structure. So like we have something we call a content planning session, which is another 45 minute session that we'll get on with someone, whether or not their client to help them like book out, you know, all their content for a podcast. It's another 45 minutes we can spend with them, right? And provide value to them. And then we have, we invite them on, and this is one of the things that I know you were impressed with is we'll invite them onto our podcast, this one, The Hero Show. And we'll talk about their business and build those kind of things. And so like, th those are just two, but like, so that's our, we got our sales call and then at least two 45 minute calls that are all value driven that are helping to warm up that relationship. They're, they're part of that post sales call follow up to help build those relationships. Right. And that's where I think particularly with cold lead, that can be really powerful is if you have. Yeah, it's and even before the sales call, you have to make sure that you're delivering as much value as possible, whether it's sending over a two minute lead magnet video oh, on how right. you helped. So we have that. So yeah. we've got the pre. Yeah. Which, by the way, I know between us, I every call I get on, if they've watched that video, they're like, that video is amazing, right? And so it's yeah. like the first part is like they get call, they get value before the call, they get value on the call, and then we have our couple of value points after the call. So it's at yeah. least four, I call them deposits into the bank of goodwill, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's how and we even in the first touch point in the first email that you sent to us or first message or whatever. And one of the strategies we just make sure we use is delivering value. So, hey, Richard, I filmed a two minute video on how you can book 23 sales opportunities in just five weeks, just using cold email. Can I send it over? Yeah. Delivering value. Okay. When they first, or when you're following up with them and let's say you don't hear back from them, you deliver them value, whether it's through case studies or a quick video, a quick loom you shot for them on a certain strategy you create specifically for them. And like you said, before the sales call, after the sales call, it's just, you really have to make sure that value is the North star to try and convert that prospect from cold to closed. Yeah. And so like one of the things we're working on now is we started our own podcast for push button podcasts. And each one of the episodes is it's like a how to, it's like a whole strategy session mm. on a specific mm. aspect of podcasting. And we're going to build a whole automated follow-up structure that every week or so they're going to get another like, hey, here's a whole breakdown of another strategy that'd be useful. So we just have more excuses to follow up with them and provide value. Because we know <laughs> we've got like that three month sales cycle, we might as well cram that three month sales cycle full of value so that like when they're actually like, yeah. okay, we want to close. These guys have been nothing but providing value for us. Imagine what it's like to actually work with them kind of thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So and I know people should know this. Right. Because if they're doing the content marketing, right, they're in that build category or they're in the Facebook ads category. They do the same thing, but because they don't see the it's like pre-sale follow up. So they're getting warmed up before the sales call. And the only difference is with cold is you're doing all of that after the sales call. So it doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're a bad Absolutely. Lead. You still have to put that time in. Right. You still have to put that time in with someone yeah. no like and trust. The, the piece of the puzzle was just shifted from here being before the call to with cold outbound being after the call. Mm -hmm. So it still has to be done. It's just with cold, you have to do it afterwards. Yeah. And the benefit of that is that with cold is one of the few that you can just scale up to whatever you want, right? You can, mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. leverage you can mm -hmm. dial up. So anyways, yeah. I, which is crazy because if you had talked to me six months ago, I would have told you that cold is stupid. Just like you just, <laughs> I would have been my comment. I mean, too. The only cap is the, the, the total adjustable market you have. That's literally sure. your only cap with cold outbound. It's the most cost effective and it's truly, and if the market's big enough, it truly becomes a numbers game of how much volume can we ram into the system to get more calls out. Obviously you wow. want to make sure you optimize a number, but ultimately yeah, you can, if you want to be that guy, you can just blast out as much volume as much as you want. And you know that you will have a filled up calendar yeah. the next week but because of that. I have had, we started cold outreach in October of 2023. That was last year, right? I know what year we're on. In October of 2023, I have had at least 20 sales calls every week since then, including through the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> None of my other channels have been able to deliver that. 
and that kind of volume, right? And so mm. the end result of that is I still close more business from the other channels just because of the, what do you call it? The speed to, from lead to close. But oh. what's happening now is like the calls from October are starting to get to that close point now in January, right? And so that's just going to ramp up as we continue to move through and get more of that mm-hmm. stuff going. So anyways, it's worthwhile if your business can sustain the volume over time that it's going to take to actually make that happen. And so anyways, and I like it a lot. Yeah, it's really good. Also, if you start out the first, my situation, you start out your first company, you're looking for a cost of way to acquire clients or customers, wherever you name it in your industry. And now it just becomes of, okay, so I already know what's, one, it becomes a really good method for acquiring your first couple of clients to build good, goodwill, to build out the case study that you will have yeah. all over your front end when you're on ads or whatever it is. So yeah. it's really good, not just when you're scaling, but also when you're just starting out. The other thing that's really useful for the just starting out point, and this is, I, I don't want people to miss this particular benefit of cold outreach. A high volume of sales calls, particularly early on, means that you can practice your pitch over and over mm-hmm. again, in a low pressure situation, right? Where you're like, I, whether or not you F this sales call up, you still have five more today and five more tomorrow and five more the day after that you have to get on these sales yeah, calls. Yeah. You can practice your pitch over and over again. You can adjust it. You can get feedback from people d- dynamically as you're having the calls with them. Oh, that didn't land. Let's try it different on the next call. So you can refine your pitch really quickly. And that's one of the things that happened for us from October to December. Our pitch got refined really fast because our volume of sales calls went from two or three a week to five a day, right? And when you go from two or three a week with warm people where the sales call is like, yep, I like your offer. Let's just buy, right? Like I'm not really working on a pitch. It was just like, hey, here's what we do. They already know, like, and trust me, it's closed, right? And so I didn't have to, what's the word? Like refine the offer by fire. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's also like, it's a really good vehicle for when you want to test out the offer that you want to, what's it called? Because you can just say after the next day, email 5,000 people or 10,000 people, look at the numbers and determine of whether this offer that you're planning of having all over your front end and all over your website would actually be worthwhile and your ideal client profile would be attracted to it. So it's really good for market research as well. Yeah. So that was a long answer to the short question of what's your common enemy, but I want to talk about the <laughs> side. The flip side of your common enemy, which is your common enemy is what you fight against, then your driving force is what you fight for, right? So just Mm -hmm. like, you know, Spider-Man fights to save New York or Batman fights to save Gotham or Google fights to index and categorize all the world's information. What is it that you guys are fighting for at Vanover Media? Ultimately solving client acquisition problems, particularly ultimately close and particularly having a consistent flow of leads coming in to the point where if my client Let's say you, Richard, you say to me, Abdel, I want to get to 200 meetings a month. I can go look at our campaigns. I can crunch the numbers. I can tell you specifically how many emails we need to be sending to get you to that number. So it's essentially, it's building out the system for them where they never have to worry where the next call will come from. And therefore the next client will come from because now they have a machine feeding them that and we're handing in that machine for them. And the best part is our compensation is dependent on our performance. So we really have to perform if we want to make some money. <laughs> now, here's my sort of follow-up question for that, because we don't often get a chance to talk to a lot of young entrepreneurs who are at the beginning of their business. So how did you arrive at this wanting to drive sales opportunities for businesses as being a driving force, something that you want to actually do and a problem that you want to solve for people? It's a good question. So... For you to understand that, what was I doing before? I want you to understand what was I doing before that. And I'm still doing that as well. I was a social media manager and I still am for a tech coaching company and I still have them on board and I still, I'm on the team. Okay. But I, and I knew friends who were into called outbound lead generation. So I sat there and researched it and learned and Legion I'm talking about while also doing the job I had, or I still have it, social media management, video editing, all that for my, the very first client I got in my entrepreneurship journey, which was not related to lead gen. So then a lot of friends that were doing this called outbound lead gen business, 
And I was really interested. I asked them so much questions because I was really curious to, particularly the psychology of it, of how you managed to convert a person who you just emailed into a paying client. And I thought, if I learn this, I will never go broke because I will learn, because I'll be solving one of the main problems businesses face, which is where are we going to get our next client from? So I thought it's a skill to learn where I know that no matter what happens, I can still eat. Yeah. So that's how I got into it. That's, that's great, essentially great. it. I actually got into marketing for the same reason. And so yeah. the, this show is called The Hero Show. And, you know, so we talk about businesses as if they're comic book superheroes. So I have my own superhero, what would you call it? My superhero identity, right? And so my superhero identity is called The Alchemist. And The Alchemist specifically because of the way I always looked at marketing was modern day marketing is like the alchemy of old. If you learn to master it, you can turn your words into gold, right? And that psychology always really fascinated me, right? That if you string the right words together and you put them in front of someone in the right order in the right time, that you can literally turn your words into gold. And like, it's the only real form of alchemy that I am aware of, where you can quite literally turn words into gold if you learn this process. And so it has mm -hmm. fascinated me for, at this point, 25 years, right? And you're just at the beginning <laughs> of that process of like, this is really yeah. cool that like, if we learn this process, everyone will always have this problem. It doesn't matter what happens with social media. It doesn't matter what happens with the internet. It doesn't matter what happens. Like, as long as we don't have like Armageddon and the, like the race is wiped out tomorrow, like yeah. people, yeah. this, it doesn't matter what mm -hmm. happens with technology. It doesn't matter if we become multi-planetary and we start traveling and doing all this stuff. People are going to need to know how to turn people from cold into closed. Like it's just, it's a thing that's going to have to happen no matter what. So you'll never go hungry. Absolutely. So I'm never hungry. I always, I'll, but Betty will always be full. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. So I love that. And yeah, I had the same thought process when I started my business. So as I was like, if I'm going to dedicate my life to learning a skill set, I want to dedicate it to a skill set that I know will always be useful no matter what. Right. And so like, you know, as compared to like maybe a skill, like, you know, shoeing horses, that might have been really valuable in the 1920s or like earlier than that. But today it's not that super valuable because how many people ride horses to work? Very few, right? And, you know, we might see the same thing happening nowadays with, you know, working on, what do you call it? Gas engine cars where like, you know, at the end of their life, their effective lifespan over the next 10 to 15 years, you know, or learning to work on electric cars probably has a lot farther like lifespan to happen. But anyways, I don't know. That's just a thought for people on like how, you know, why you get into something universal. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know what, let me tie this back to specifically what we do for our clients. Typically, I don't know, and I, this is what I did with you. Typically, this, the clients that we have on board, they come on board with something, I call, and I got this from a mentor, an attention generate, an attention capturing offer. Attention capturing is where you're, offer or the messaging that you put out on the front end would only resonate with the person who's looking for that specific service. Let's tie it back to podcasts. Instead of saying, hey, you're looking to start and host your own podcast, we would change that into an attention generating one mm -hmm. where the person doesn't really care about the service. They just care about how you're going to get there from A to B. Yeah. They care and about most importantly, B. So then we would change that. Um, podcast offering into ever considered podcast for more clients. Okay. Going back here with the skill sets of even if the person is not looking specifically for someone to help them with a the client acquisition, it's always good to have it regardless because it's a need. It's not a want. Absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. Right. And that's where you're like, I know our campaigns have been working really well for a couple of different reasons. And maybe one of these days we'll do like a special episode and come on it. You know, I think we're actually going to have you on our push button podcasts podcast, which is, you know, for, for the push button podcast company. And we'll talk about Love it. cold outreach. Cause you know, we talk a lot of times, you know, podcasting is in for the businesses. It's in that world of lead generation. So we want to bring experts on in the different categories and talk about how they fit together and how we're using podcasts as part of our cold lead gen outreach. Right. And so like, uh, you know, and it's one of the things that I know you and I have been sort of geeking out about is that our podcast, <laughs> the hero show is part of our cold outreach. And we're, yeah. how that it's how we're using it to drive leads specifically. And so it's a really fascinating sort of way that you can tie, tie things together. So I'm sure we'll be discussing that more as we, we, well, yeah, yeah. we definitely will be. I'll hold you accountable to that. <laughs> so 
I want to flip over to a more practical portion of our show. I call this the hero's tool belt. Right. I mean, just like every superhero has a tool belt with awesome gadgets like batarangs and web slingers and maybe magical hammers that you can spin and fly with or laser eyes. I'm going to talk about the top one or two tools that you couldn't live without in your business. Could be anything from your notepad to your calendar to your marketing tools to something you use for your product delivery. What is something that you use every day that is essential to getting your job done? Google Drive, one million percent. It's such a basic answer. Google Drive, I'll tell you why. Because I've been using that since day one where if I switch to another, what's to like one software drive. or yeah, something like that, it's not going to feel the same. It's don't cheat on your day ones. That's the philosophy I live by. So why would I change what I've been doing since I started my entre entrepreneurship journey? Yeah. One of the tools. I love Google Coffee Drive. Time. Google Drive is one of those ones that we use every day too. So like we use their shared drive functionality and every single one of our clients has their own shared drive that they can you know, for file permission stuff. And it just makes it, and like ev everything we do, all of the assets that we create, all of the content that we create, it all goes back into Google Drive, all the backups, everything are in there. And it just makes it so that like, I can work on it, my staff can work on it, all of our clients can see all the work in there. Yeah. And it's just, oh, man, it's one of those things that like 15 years ago, nothing like that existed. And you had to worry about like hard drive spaces and all these other things and figuring out how to get files back and forth. And now everything just lives on Google Drive and it blows me away that we get it for like, I don't know, it's like $12 a month per user or something like that, which is nuts. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And it's the fact where I don't need to have my laptop with me. I just need to know the email and password yeah. for my Google Workspace and, I'm, and I can get to work. Yeah, and for like, you know, I know my audience knows that I travel full time. Most of the time I've got my laptop with me, but I have had on occasion where like a client's like, I've got an emergency or something. We need to get something taken care of. I can pick up anyone's computer anywhere in the world and log in my Google workspace thing and fix something for someone. That's a username and password that's in my head. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. next to the internet, I have a workstation, which is nuts to me. Yeah, no, it's, it absolutely. It's one of the benefits. It's amazing. Yeah. So I'm a huge fan of a lot of those online tools for growing your company. And it's like, I tell people nowadays that like we're in the golden age of business, right? It's never been easier than it is today yeah. you know, with tools like Google Drive and Zoom or Squadcast or Descript and some of the AI tools that are coming out. It is, it's crazy the kind of stuff that we can do. And it's like, you know, Google Drive, for instance, like the drive functionality is just one part of it. It also gives you Google Docs and Google Sheets and Google Slide for presentations and we have Google groups and Google sites that we put our process documentation stuff in. It's like this whole suite of tools. And I know like our favorite one right now is a little add-on for Google Docs, which if you haven't played with it yet, it's super fun. It's called Google Docs for work. And you add the little add-on into Google Docs and then you put in your mm -hmm. OpenAI API key and then you mm -hmm. use ChatGPT directly in Google Docs. And I do the exact same, but for Sheets. Yeah, so you can do it with Sheets as well. We haven't, we don't play with the Sheets as much because that's just not our business. We do a lot more in writing content for our clients. So it's the Google Docs one is the one we use, but man, the, such cool tools we have available. To yeah, them. yeah. I would, this is how you know that I'm progressing as an entrepreneur. When I'm getting geeked out about AI stuff, that relates back to my work. Yeah, to Google Sheets, right? You know, it's AI. Yeah. <laughs> so the nerdiest thing I do right now and I still like, it kind of blows me away that this is my life, that this is part of my life is that I like one of the things I'm working on is our spreadsheet for the back end of our agency that goes over like the actual like hours that are going to every single like asset that we produce. And I was like, I needed to get some very specific numbers calculated. And I was like, I don't know how to calculate these numbers. Like, I don't know. I don't even know the formulas or like what I'm capable of doing. So I just brought my Google sheet over to Google, or, you know, to open AI. And I was like, here's the data I have. And here's the data I want to get out of it. <laughs> Can you tell me how I make those formulas? And it would write all the formulas for me. And I put them, just put them into the sheets thing. And I was like, last year, yeah. I would have had to hire someone who was like college educated in Excel to get that work done. And now I just asked a robot and it just did it for me, which is crazy. Literally is. It literally is. I integrate ChatGPT so much in our own operations, whether even from the first step that the client comes on board so we use it in our onboarding processes we use it in our service delivery of let's say i'm writing up copy and i'm trying to say something but i really want to make sure that the clarity is 10 10 so when the prospect reads it they, they know exactly what i'm trying to mean here ChatGPT is perfect for that yeah yeah it's one of those things and, i my son is 14 so he's probably like 10 years your junior um and i as soon as ChatGPT came out for school i bought him a professional account for ChatGPT. 
And so like we pay the monthly fee for him. And I was like, listen, this is not optional, right? If you return back into me a piece of written work that has spelling and grammar errors in it, I'm going to give it back to you. I was like, because you have a word calculator now that your you, the workforce is going to expect that you know how to use, right? Like by the time he's in the workforce, which is several years in the future, it's not like, like we're using it today and my staff all knows how to use it. You're yeah. using it today. Your staff all knows how to use it, right? It's not going to be optional for him. So it's got to be part of his curriculum growing up now is like learning how to use these things and use these tools because, man, the landscape of tools is shifting rapidly right now. And, you know. Those companies like yours and mine who are actively looking how we integrate them and use them, I think it's an important piece. Yeah, yeah. And n now it comes a puzzle of how much can I integrate this to then, whether it's to cut down costs or make sure that to reduce how long, reduce a certain process from two weeks to just two days. Mm -hmm. Now it becomes a question of how much can I integrate this to and in every aspect of whether it's on the from the first touch point of um, the campaigns that we send out for our own client acquisition to then for when service delivery is being done. So it's just in all realm, realms of a company, it becomes a question of how much can I integrate this AI stuff into it? Yeah. So there's two things I want to point out for that for people, because, you know, we've been doing a lot and I've been thinking about how we can communicate this to other companies. And so the two things I think are really important are one is what I call breaking the iron triangle, right? So the goal of AI right now, if you're trying to integrate into your company, is how do you break the iron triangle? So what is the iron triangle? Iron triangle is better, cheaper, faster, pick two, right? Everyone's heard that, right? right. You can have better or cheaper, but you're, it's gonna be slower, or you can have you know better and faster, but it's not gonna be, it's gonna be expensive, right? So you can't have better, cheaper, faster, you can't have those three things. AI allows you to break the iron triangle. It's like, I can offer better services at a higher quality, you know, so higher quality services, faster to my clients for cheaper than I could before, right? And then Generally, on that cheaper side, I can split that cheaper into both margin for the company and cost reductions for the customer, right? And so both of those sides work for us. And that's what we, one of the things that we've been doing is focusing on that. And then the second aspect of that is how does AI work with human beings? And I think the biggest mm -hmm. mistake most companies right now are making is when they're playing with these AI tools is they're looking and they're asking themselves, how do I replace people in my processes? And I think that's the wrong question to ask. And the right question, which I think fits nicely into yeah. our hero show thing here, is how do you make your team superhuman with access to these tools? Really? So instead of trying to replace human beings, make your human beings superhuman, right? And because they're never going to be replaceable because the robots are never going to be able to understand context. They're never going to be able to understand culture and society the way that your human beings are going to be able to. And so your goal should be how do you marry these tools together? How do you marry the people together on your team with the AI tools that are going to make their business or make their work better? And so that's, those are the two things that we look at. How do you break the iron triangle using, by integrating these AI tools? And then how do you marry them together with your human beings to make them superhuman? Absolutely. Bang on the money right there of instead of thinking, how can I use AI to replace my staff and cut down on costs is how can I use AI to make sure that my staff are super staff? Yeah. Like you just how, said. How, like, how would you, like a, a company that's replaced all their staff with robots versus a staff of superhumans, who's going to win that race, right? It's the superhumans every time. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so, obviously. yeah, obviously. It's not even a question when you frame it that way. People are like, oh, that makes sense. But yeah, that's the thing that people, that I see people struggling with is they're like, oh, I can replace this person on my staff or re replace this role. And I'm like, listen, you know what would be better is if you made that role superhuman with these tools. Mm. Right, because that's how you get back to that breaking the iron triangle. Because if you try to replace staff, then you're going to go back to that better, cheaper, faster pick too, right? But if you make your staff superhuman, that's when you can break the iron triangle. So those two things tie together that way. Speaking of heroic tools, I want to take a few minutes to tell you about a tool we built that powers the Hero Show and is now this show's primary sponsor. Hey there, fellow podcaster. Having a weekly audio and video show on all the major online networks that builds your brand, creates fame, and drives sales for your business doesn't have to be hard. I know it feels that way because you've tried managing your show internally and realize how resource intensive it can be. You felt the pain of pouring eight to 10 hours of work into just getting one hour of content published and promoted all over the place. You see the drain on your resources, but you do it anyways because you know how powerful it is. Heck, you've probably even tried some of those automated solutions and ended up with stuff that makes your brand look cheesy and cheap. That's not helping grow your business. Don't give up though. 
The struggle ends now. Introducing Push Button Podcasts, a done-for-you service that will help you get your show out every single week without you lifting a finger after you've pushed that stop record button. We handle everything else, uploading, editing, transcribing, writing, research, graphics, publication, and promotion, all done by real humans who know, understand, and care about your brand almost as much as you do. Empowered by our own proprietary technology, our team will let you get back to doing what you love while we handle the rest. Check us out at pushbuttonpodcast.com forward slash hero for 10% off the lifetime of your service with us and see the power of having an audio and video podcast growing and driving micro celebrity status and business in your niche without you having to lift more than a finger to push that stop record button. Again, that's pushbuttonpodcast.com forward slash hero. See you there. You're listening to The Hero Show, unlocking the power of influence and success. So I got one more question for you here as we come up on the end of this hour. I want to talk to you about your guiding principles, right? One of the things that makes heroes heroic is that they live by a code. For instance, Batman never kills his enemies. He only ever brings them to Arkham Asylum. So as we wrap up the interview, I want to talk about the top one, maybe two principles that you live your life by, you run your business by. What is your guiding principle? I want to think about this one. I would say that I... It, what and especially right now because now we found out the really kind of companies that we really like to work with is I wouldn't take on board on board someone unless I have absolute confidence I can help them. It's not even for the sake of yeah sure I close them the money's nice but they may not even get value out of my service or out of our partnership. So even in the first call when I get on with them if I get a whiff that this partnership wouldn't be successful when I don't see us having an impact on the company. I just tell them up front, hey, I don't think it would make sense for us to partner up. I mean, it's been great talking to you, but I just, I'm looking to people who I can truly help and I don't think you need my help or I don't think I would be able to help you. Yeah. So, so it's a form of, it's, one of really. it's like, hey, this is the value we give to the world and I don't know that your company can get value from that. So if there's not an alignment, we I don't want your money. Yeah, yeah, because sure, I can ask you the questions and I can repeat back everything you want to hear. And I can, what's it called? And I can say the right things to kind of align my service or my offer to what you look to achieve. But if, let's say, when, once we get down to it and we have to deliver for you guys and I'm unsure on how the results will turn out, well, I wouldn't take you on because I'm not looking to onboard someone that I have to think of. Is this person going to get burned by me or is he actually going to have an amazing experience by me? I want to have absolute confidence that I can help this person. That's one of the company. dangers of learning to get good at marketing and sales is that you could sell ice to Eskimos, but do the Eskimos need ice, right? Like yeah. you can get good at the process of selling anyone to anything because human beings are all the same, right? We have the same, like the psychology of selling doesn't change. Even culture to culture, it really doesn't and or over generation to generation and so like you can master those skills of being a good salesman and that's where you know the bad name of like you know the used car salesman comes in right and it's yeah. people abuse that power when they have it and so what you're saying is like hey if i want to build a company that's going to last that has a good reputation in the marketplace that you have to sell with integrity especially in a marketplace where the, your ideal prospects have been burnt it, there's almost like trigger words if you say to them lead gen they think uh scam yeah. or anything anything like that so that reputation aspect is super important where your ideal client profile where the market is more sophisticated the market is more sophisticated so you have to show up and sell with integrity which i think is a great place to to wrap our interview but i do finish every interview with something i call the hero's challenge and i do this to help get access to other stories that we might not otherwise find on our own so the question is simple do you have someone in your life or in your network who you think has a cool entrepreneurial story who are they First names are fine. And why do you think they should come share their story with us here on The Hero Show? First person that comes to mind for you. He's my mentor. He's my business mentor. His name is Benjamin Brooks. Super successful guy. But it's the reason I say him is because his story is really interesting. And I think if you ever have him on the show, you'll realize why he's super interesting because he had so many options, so many career options to go down on. And he chose the entrepreneurship one. Yeah, that's really cool. Well. We don't always get a yes when we ask for those, but sometimes when we do, we get really cool stories. So we'll see if we can get an introduction to him and maybe get him on the show. But in comic books, there's always the crowd of people at the end who are cheering and clapping for the acts of heroism. So our yeah. analogous to that on this show is where can people find you if they want your help in the future? Where can they light up the bat signal and say, hey, Abdel, I like to get cold outreach going in my business. Can you help me with that? 
But I think more important than where is who are the right types of people to raise their hand and actually ask for your help. Brilliant. So let's start off with the who is more specifically, if you are a company that you already have product market fit and you already know that the service or the offer that you want to get more customers for, you know, this is something that is needed by this, by the market you're looking to target, which brings me on to, you know, the market you want to target. We have a clear ideal client profile. You know, the industry that you're looking to go after. And third of all, you're willing to make uncomfortable decisions to make sure uh, for cold acquisition. What I mean by that is if you've never run a performance aspect of your offer or you've never run a performance incentive, then it's one of those things where we want you to feel comfortable doing that because it all goes back to trust when it goes at the beginning of our conversation. Trust is absolutely key, called outbound. And adding something like that performance incentive helps with that. So a company who's looking, has product market fit, they know the market they want to go after, and they're also they're willing to make changes to their front end messaging in the campaigns that would be running for them. And the way that they can find me is the classic. You can go on my website, Zanaver, our company's website, zanaver.com, Z-A-N-I-V-A-R.com. My LinkedIn, Abdel Shafiq, if you want to shoot me a message or you, or you want some more advice on how you can get better results out of your outbound campaign or how you can get started on one. And I also have a YouTube channel, Abdel Shafiq. I post on there every single week about strategies, changes, and you can find me on there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I don't always get to do this because I don't always interview vendors of mine, but Abdel and Zanover is one of our vendors at Push Button Podcasts. And we've been working with you guys since what is like November, December of last year. And yeah. we've already got, I told you, it was, we have the longer, the longer sales close cycle. We've already started closing some of our sales and some of them are big strategic partner type stuff. And it's going to, I think this year going to be a humongous portion of our leads that turn into sales are going to come from cold outreach, whether that's LinkedIn or email. And I know Abdel and I are already talking about different ways we can add cold outreach to our business. So I can't recommend cold outreach enough. And then on in that world, um, Abdel has been fantastic to work with him and his organization. So definitely take a chance on them and reach out to them for that. And again, thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing your story, Abdel. Oh. I love getting a chance to hear entrepreneurs. So do you have any final words of wisdom for our audience before we hit this stop record button? That risky decision you're thinking of right now, just do it. Just do it. You know what I love about that? I go out and do podcasts well, regularly, and that is the exact same advice I give people when people ask me that question. I'm like, what's the one piece of advice you give? I'm like, whatever it is you're vacillating about, you know, wringing your hands, thinking about, just do it. Because that's where all the fun happens is when yeah, you just do it. What's the worst that will happen? Just do it. Just do it. Thanks for coming on the show today, Abdel. Well, thank you for having me on board. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of The Hero Show, where we work to shift the cultural narrative around entrepreneurship and celebrate the heropreneurs who make our world a better place. Don't forget to visit our website at theheroshow.tv, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or via RSS, so you'll never miss an episode. If you found value in our show, we'd truly appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or better yet, share it with a friend to help us spread the message of entrepreneurship as a force for good. Curious to learn more about the stories and insights of these incredible heropreneurs? Check out our in-depth interviews and resources on our website. Together, let's support and inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs as they embark on their own heroic journeys. Join us again next week for another episode of The Hero Show, where we'll continue to explore the world of heropreneurs, their superpowers, and the positive impact they bring to our lives. Until then, stay heroic.